Today is March 8th, 2020. My name is Cristo Ortefuente, and I'm conducting an interview with Cynthia Munoz for the Voces of Mariachi Project, part of the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. We are in San Antonio, Texas, at the University of Texas San Antonio's downtown campus. Thank you, Ms. Munoz, for being here and sharing your perspective with us today. Absolutely. Before, thank you. Before we start, we want to make sure that we tell you this is an unedited interview that will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection and will be open to the public. So if there's anything you don't want to discuss, you are under no obligation to discuss it. Also, if there's anything you wish to discuss, please make sure to let me know. Or if you would like me to ask a specific question, please um, feel free to let me know that at your discretion. Um, and at any time, if you'd like to stop the interview, you have to use the restroom, anything, just please let me know. Don't hesitate um, to ask. Okay. <clears throat> and I have to be quiet so I can't really like interact with you or say anything. Okay. So I'm going to try to be as quiet <laughs> as possible. Okay. Um, you want me looking at you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, let's get started. All right. Um, so tell me a little bit about your childhood. Uh, I grew up here in San Antonio, born and raised, and I have three siblings and a mom and dad, and I um, grew up in a very traditional Hispanic household. We had, you know, back in those days, we had a meal with the whole family every day, uh, right as my father came home from work at Kelly Air Force Base, and so we can say that um, we had a really nice childhood in the in the in the manner that my mother made homemade meals for us and we ate as a family together every day. And I think back at how special that was because it seems so rare that that happens these days. How did you get started on your musical journey? Well, I my parents used to take us on special occasions to San Jose Mission when we had family visiting from out of town. And it was uh, always on those special uh, days when we had visitors that we would get to go to San Jose Mission to the Mariachi and, and experience the Mariachi Mass. And uh, that was one of the, the, the things that we did on a regular basis. And it was always very, very moving for me to hear the music and um, to experience such such beautiful music that just really touched my heart and um, and fed me a lot of energy. My mother had to slap my hand because I would wanted wanted to dance in church to the music, but she had to keep hitting my hand so I would stop moving as a young kid. And um, we did things that, like really special things. I remember seeing an orphanage from Monterrey, Mexico perform at St. Henry's Church and they played the most beautiful music. The songs like Cielito Lindo and Guadalajara and Eres Tu. And I remember probably being about 11 years old when I heard this amazing rondaya perform and, and the hair on my arms just kind of like stuck up because it was like, wow, this is so amazing. And I also remember my parents taking us to, to concerts, like when Vicente Fernandez performed here in San Antonio um, at the old arena, and, and, and Alejandro Fernandez at the time was only about five years old, and it was that magical shot that you just kind of see over and over that the media loves to play when, when Alejandro forgot the words or he just got so nervous and he started crying and his dad is holding him in his arms. I was there at that concert and it was just, um, it's so fun, you know, to watch and remember that that happened right here in San Antonio. So, so we were, you know, we grew up with those beautiful experiences with my, my parents taking us to to go see the Srandaya, to go see Vicente Fernandez, to go see the Mariachi Choir at San Jose Mission. And then uh, my dad was really into sports and my, he coached my brothers in football and baseball. And one day there was a, one of his football players who had a sister 
who was part of the mariachi choir at San Jose Mission. And so my mom told me, yeah, did you know that, that uh, you know, so-and-so's sister, you know, plays in the mariachi choir, and she's part of the Sarandaya with the Orta family, and I'm like, mom, 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 can I go? Can you take me, please? I, I just, like, wanted to be part of that so much, and we finally had this connection that would allow me to, like, you know, see what it's all about. And so my mom's like, yes, don't worry, I've already asked. And they have, you know, these, the Orta family, you know, teaches this rondaya at a place called Via Maria. And it was uh, like a convent that was right near Central Catholic High School. And so um, thank, thanks to this fellow football team member of my brother's, I was able to to start going to these classes that were taught by Jesse and Josephine Orta. And this family, you know, was probably the, the family that, that had uh, the greatest impact on me because of their generosity in uh, teaching so many children and adults how to sing and play the guitar and the vihuela and the guitarron and of course, jo Josephine Orta's uh, primary instrument was the bandolin, and Jesse's primary instrument was the trumpet. And then, of course, they had their daughters, uh, Geraldine Bubu Orta, who played the vihuela, and also Denise and, and Carol, who's still around running the program there at the San Jose Mission. So. This was a family who, I understand, went to Mexico back in the 60s. They studied the mariachi mass. They brought that back to San Antonio. And through this one family, they taught hundreds, hundreds of children and adults for free all of the beautiful cultural traditions of, of, um, of Mexico through, through the mass. And, and that was really special because, you know, there was no nonprofit organization. There was no, you know, funding that was needed. I mean, people did it, they did it, they taught, and we were involved in that because we wanted to learn um, the culture. We wanted to learn the traditions. Uh, we did, I did not grow up in a household that celebrated the posadas or the serenata para el virgen or the dia de las madres those are all beautiful cultural traditions that we learned from being involved through the church and with the orta family they are the ones that taught us that there was this very special time of the year during mother's day and there are these they, they taught us all the beautiful songs that are sung to mothers during this time of year, like Hema and Las Mañanitas and um, um, Madrecita Querida. These are all beautiful songs that we grew up learning, and 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 it was really fun to, you know, be able to go to each of our members' um, houses and sing to their mothers at midnight. Uh, these songs that were taught to us. And so we did that throughout the year and all these, um, you know, celebrations, whether it be during Christmas and singing those songs that we were taught, you know, for the posadas or the Serenata para el Virgen or Serenata para las Madres or Geraldine Orta used to invite us all the time, you know, when there was a funeral or a rosary or a quinceanera or a birthday celebration. And there was a whole set list of songs that were uh, appropriate for each of these occasions. And we, I spent my entire childhood from probably the age of 12 years old to 18 years old every weekend this is what we did for fun and it was so much fun we played at mass or we'd play at a quinceanera or we'd play at some party this is what we did throughout my childhood and i can't think of of doing anything that i can imagine that could be more fun than that <laughs> um <clears throat> so when you were growing up this was a big impact on you what was your idea then of being a mariachi? Like, what did that mean to you? 
as a little girl, like seeing these amazing people playing and doing this work? Like, what was the idea in your head? Mm. I don't know if I ever, um, I guess there were just so many forms of, of the music. There, w there was this rondaya, then there were like these trios, there were these cuartetos, there were these cantantes, there were, then there were mariachi groups. I never really, I never really, you know, dreamt that I would be a mariachi. <laughs> It was more about the music, the culture, being part of something much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. It was being a part of a, almost like a political movement, a social movement, a cultural movement. Um, you know, my fa growing up, my father would tell us stories about him in school, being in school, and, and being punished, like literally being punished, being, being slapped on the hand with the ruler for speaking Spanish. So for, for me, it was like this, just this incredible sense of, of, of freedom and of cultural expression. And it was very powerful. It was just so much more than, than just mariachi. It was a bigger, 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 um, I felt like it was, we were having a much bigger impact of being able to celebrate the culture in a much bigger way. Okay. Who are your favorite musicians and why? Who are my favorite mu musicians and why? Um, mariachi musicians or Anything. any musicians? Yes, all of it. Um, well, I... You know, I'm, I'm grateful to my parents. Um, neither of them played any instruments, um, but they both loved music. And my father loved the conjunto music. Um, he was very passionate about that. He was very passionate about the stories that were told and sung through conjunto music. And it wasn't, it wasn't until he was about 70 or 75 that he finally started taking um, accordion lessons and following his passion of learning how to play the accordion. So um, he always loved music and my mother always loved all of the beautiful musicals that came out on television, all of the beautiful television movies like the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and the Sound of Music and all of the beautiful Barbra Streisand and Dolly Parton, you know, movies, all of the, the movies that they were in. And um, uh, so, so we grew up watching those as a family together. And I, um, you know, I, was, I guess I, I kind of learned a lot about, you know, from watching those, those beautiful musicals with my family. And so, what was the question again? <laughs> um, what was your favorite musician? Oh, so what, so who were my favorite musicians? Uh, I guess growing up, it, you know, I have to say it was you know Barbara Streisand. That's who we grew up with. Barbara Barbara Streisand, Dolly Parton, um, um, Sound of Music, uh, well, Wizard of Oz. You know, Judy Garland. Um, it was it was the it was those. Yeah, all the female, you know, vocalists that were so amazing. Um, the Sound of Music, um, um, what's her name? Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Andrews. So uh, Julie Andrews, Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, uh, Dolly Parton. I mean, those, those became my favorites. And, uh, and my grandmother also loved music, my, gr my mother's mother. And when my parents would take us over to my grandmother's house to, you know, enjoy time with my grandmother, um, the first thing I would do was go to her living room where she had a record player and this incredible collection of records that was everything from Johnny Cash to, 
um, um, to you know get all these Barbara Streisand, you know Dolly Parton. Um, it was um, just these oldies, and and I just sat there for hours and hours and hours, just playing one record after another, and it was before you can access all the words on the internet, so you had to, you know, just play the record over and over and over to learn the words and sing along. And so that's how I, I spent my childhood, watching a lot of movies, musicals, listening to a lot of records, and also um, going to events, thanks to my parents, giving us this experience. Mm -hmm. um, what instrument did you choose when you started in mariachi, and how did you come about choosing that instrument? Um, my, my parents bought me a guitar for Christmas one day. They just knew that I was fond of music, and I think that was just like, you know, I don't know the instrument, to, the good instrument to start out with. So, so they started me out with the guitar, and I, I played that, and and uh, and Geraldine Orta and and Josephine were the ones that that taught me just the basic G D E and all all the the basic um, uh, you know notes and. Um, and that's how I started with the guitar, and and then later uh, with the violin. Mm -hmm. And what was your family's reaction to you wanting to be a mariachi? Um, well, it it was it was a rondaya first, so it wasn't. I I never really again saw myself as being a mariachi because I was being part of this group where there was a lot of guitars and they called it a rondaya. So, um, so as I, when I entered, I was, I was entering the, that, whole er, that whole genre through, through participation in the church, and it was something that was really beautiful. And of course, my, my parents really uh, supported that. And, um, and so I, I saw myself as part of a rondaya and the church choir, and then, you know, uh, of course, the church mariachi. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And were there other people in your family who were mariachis either while you were or after? No one in my family was a mariachi musician. Um, Again, the closest thing that we ever got to that was my dad, you know, loving conjunto music. And what do you remember about your first performances as a mariachi? Um, we, you know, we once we learned the basic chords, um, you know, the Orta family would invite us to to perform sometimes we would perform in one or two or three or even four mariachi masses uh, on a given sunday um, especially on those special occasions like the easter sunday um, we would perform at san jose mission at saint patrick's church at uh, uh, at San Fernando Cathedral, uh, those were like regular routes. So, um, what do I remember most is just uh, you know getting my my fill of, of prayer for the Sunday, <laughs> and um, and just you know again having a lot of fun and really enjoying you know being part of the music. And I remember thinking this would be really fun to be like a musician for the rest of my life. Like this is really enjoyable singing just, you know, all day long and, and playing. And so, um, so I just really, really enjoyed the moment very much. And I, I, I don't feel like I missed out on anything. It was just how we spent every single weekend. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So, um, did you play in any mariachi groups after college or in college? 
No, from from the so from the church, uh, then I was invited to be part of the San Antonio. At that time, in the seventies, the uh, mariachi music programs were were getting started in the schools, and so I started playing with the San Antonio Independent School District mariachi group. Then there's I officially you know was part of a mariachi. And uh, that was um, that was something that I did um, up until graduating from high school. Today, there are many programs within colleges and universities, many mariachi music programs. So it's very exciting to see the University of Texas in Austin and UTSA and San Antonio College and Palo Alto College and. Uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and Texas A&M Laredo, Texas A&M San Antonio, Texas A&M College Station. I mean, all of these colleges here in Texas have mariachi music programs, and they're good. Texas State University, excellent mariachi music program. So it's very exciting to see what we have now. But back then, when I graduated from high school, which was 1983, um, SAC had a program, uh, but it was it was uh, definitely at a different different level than what we see today. Uh, they have a, an amazing program, so that you know the programs have evolved tremendously throughout the years, and we see very good mariachi music programs at the collegiate level. And had had there been more programs at the collegiate level when I was in college, I would have definitely been part of it, I think, but, but those were just different times. And I remember after graduating from high school, uh, I was the first to go to college in my family, and I wanted to really focus on higher education and just, you know, studying and, and, and following you know, just easing into college, and I, and I just wanted that to be my priority because I knew how important it was. You know, I grew up in a household where my father, you know, would, would reinforce that message of uh, the importance of higher education every single week of our lives. Um, he would remind us that uh, education is something that, that that no one will ever be able to take away from you, that it is um, extremely important for us to go to college, to study computers, technology, or business. I didn't like computers, so I went the business route. <laughs> okay. What do you remember about the San Antonio Mariachi Festival? The very first Mariachi Music Festival here in San Antonio was founded in 1979. And from what I understand, there were a lot of people involved. And I don't really know exactly how, how it started. Um, I remember a woman by the name of Karen who worked for the city. I believe she had gone to Mexico and she had seen this mariachi group, Mariachi Vargas, the Tecali Clan, because she was part of, I think she was part of the international department for the city. And and I think this is how it happened, but I'm, I'm really, really excited to hear all the different perspectives of how how that occurred, but I think she went to Mexico, she saw Mariachi Vargas, she came back, she told people from the city, hey, we got to bring this group. And so there was a city that was involved, um, they were wanting to draw tourism, uh, there was at that time Dr. Elizondo, who I believe was the chairman for the San Antonio Penn School District, Dr. Lucille Santos, uh, Bell Ortiz. Juan Ortiz, there were a lot of people involved in helping to like make that first event happen back in 1979. So at that time I was a student playing the violin with the San Antonio Independent School District and we were, I was a participant of that festival. I wish I had the photographs right here, but I will, I will send you some. 
And um, those early festivals took place at the Market Square Outdoor, I remember competing against Los Changuitos Feos <laughs> from Tucson, Arizona, and the very first Mariachi Music Festival. And it was very exciting, and uh, we were, um, I was very inspired and very moved by Mariachi Vargas, by their performance, by their musicianship, by their voices, by the way they were able to connect with the audience. I, um, they, they, they definitely changed my life. They, their level of musicianship changed my life. And I never um, knew how, how beautiful, I always knew our culture was very beautiful, but this was at a whole new level. This opened up my world broaden my horizons and it was a different experience and so I became a huge fan of the Mariachi Vargas. They were my new, my new um, number one music group uh, in my life. That was back in 1979, yes. And then, and then the early festivals took place for a few years there. I remember uh, Bell brought in the San Antonio Symphony to perform with Mariachi Vargas. You know, that whole combination of the symphony and Vargas took place here in San Antonio for the very first time. Uh, Jose Bebe Martinez, the former musical director of Mariachi Vargas, wrote all the music for the symphony and Mariachi to perform together. And those um, festivals then went from taking place at the Market Square and the Instituto Cultural de Mexico into the Lila Cockrell Theater, where it continues today. Mm -hmm. And there was a time period in between um, the two festivals, so the extravaganza that you put on and then the one before, where the, the, it had ended. Um, right. Do you know anything about like why it had originally um, ended the first the first festivals? Uh, so the so I graduated from high school in 1983, and I don't remember a mariachi festival taking place that year. The last couple of years when I was in high school, like in 1982, 83, so I I I don't remember if there was one. Um, and then I I left San Ant I. I went to SAC for a couple of years and I auditioned to perform with the, and travel with a group called Up With People. So I was accepted to travel with this international group uh, of Up With People back in 1985 and 86. So I was gone from San Antonio for that year. And when I traveled in Up With People, we, were, we, we traveled all over the world. We were in the People's Republic of China back in the December of 1985. We traveled to Hawaii, to Canada, to all over the U.S. That's where I learned a lot about stage production and, and that kind of thing. And, and then I, I remember when I came back, I was finishing my last two years at UTSA, and that would have been 1987, 88. That's when Mariachi Vargas toured with Linda Ronstad during her Gan Gancianos de Mi Padre tour. So that was, um, I remember I wanted to go, but I didn't have any money to buy a ticket. And so I, I missed out on, I never got to see Linda Ronstad and Mariachi Vargas. But, but I remember uh, that that was a very, very significant time. Uh, in mariachi music culture, and uh, and I believe that was 1986, 87, 88. That was like when it was all happening. I graduated from college in 1988, and then I, I started working so fast in advertising right after college. And I, again, I was traveling for the next three years. I don't remember anything going on during those years, and Mariachi Vargas became so busy touring and traveling with Linda Ronstadt. They, they, you know, they recorded on her Francione Zemi Padre album that became 
to this day, it is still the highest selling Spanish language album of any kind in America. Um, and uh, and then I just I just I don't remember them ever coming back to San Antonio after they toured with Linda Ronstadt in, in those years. And then by that. The years just went on. I worked in advertising for Lionel Sosa, who founded Sosa, Bromley, Aguilar, and Associates. And during that time that I worked for Lionel, um, we, were, we were actually the first ones to bring in Luis Miguel for a concert ever, like in the history. It was like, that was like, that was around 1990. 1980. I worked for Lionel for 1988 to 1991, and um, we had all of the big accounts: Coca-Cola, American Airlines, Anheuser Busch, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and Coca-Cola was the one who sponsored the Luis Miguel uh, tour here in the United States. So I was um, I was involved a little bit with that, but I was also pr started getting involved in, in producing concerts. I did a show with Rita Moreno uh, that was part of um, one of our, our corporate sponsors who, and a, and a, and a national conference. And, uh, and I was involved in a, in a couple of other shows. I remember Lionel sending me to California, to Los Angeles to represent Coca-Cola in a beautiful show. Linda Ronstadt performed, um, um, Edward James almost performed that evening. It was a magical evening. I was sitting one table away from Ted Danson. Um, it was like the highlight of my life, really. It was like so much fun. But it was all these Latinos performing on stage, and it was such a beautiful evening. And, and so Lionel, Lionel is credited for giving a lot of Latinos and Latinas here in San Antonio the opportunity to work with corporate America to um, really get to know top Hispanic markets in the United States. Um, I wor spent much of those three years working on with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control on the America Response to AIDS campaign. So I was sent to every national convention that took place from the National Council of La Raza to the National <coughs> Bilingual Educators Conference to LULAC to um, um, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and, and every single big, you know, Latino festival across the country. So I traveled a lot throughout those three years and and really was able to get a very global perspective on what the U.S. Hispanic market looked like. So uh, coming back to your question of, of you know, those, those years it went by, I was, <clears throat> I was sort of like, <clears throat> setting the stage of what would what would come soon not really knowing that that would happen but one of the another one of the events that Lionel sent me to was uh, the Tucson mariachi music convention because at that time coca-cola was sponsoring that event San Antonio founded the, that whole concept of the mariachi music festival in 1979 and then other cities picked it up Tucson, the LA, uh, Albuquerque, and so I got to see this fabulous festival that had started in Tucson, Arizona, and it was huge, and it was like 13,000 people at the Tucson Convention Center Arena, and I remember thinking, well, we need this in San Antonio, we need this back in San Antonio, and then I was also able to experience what was going on at the Hollywood Bowl in LA. And there you have another like thousands of people. I don't know how many people the Hollywood Bowl sits, but 15,000, let's say. It's huge, beautiful outdoor amphitheater. And, and so they had gotten this event going and I had heard of the one in Albuquerque. And so uh, after three years of working with Lionel, I uh, started my own company as um, Munoz Public Relations and, and started working with Ford Motor Company on corporate education programs. And Ford came to me and said, oh, Cynthia, 
uh, we're looking for a grassroots Hispanic market event to fund. Uh, we're, and we want to appeal to professional and educated Latinos because it was really the Lincoln brand, the Lincoln brand, which is just a higher end vehicle. So they wanted to appeal to educated Latinos. And they said, do you have any ideas of what we can do? And I said, yeah, let's bring in Gloria Stefan, you know, and, and have a show with Gloria Stefan. She was really popular back then. Now I mention her name to anybody under 30, and they're like, who? <laughs> um, uh, or I said, let's bring in Placido Domingo and have a beautiful show with Placido. I said, or let's, let's bring back this concept of the Mariachi Music Festival that was founded here in San Antonio back in 1979. We can have a beautiful show with the Mariachi Vargas, the world-renowned Mariachi Vargas at the Galiclan. And, uh, and the San Antonio Symphony at the Majestic Theater have a really nice event, bring in you know, a lot of uh, your affluent, uh, professional, successful Hispanic-owned businesses and Latinos. And so Clarence Kalig, who is the owner of Kalig Enterprises, he owns North Park Lincoln Mercury and all of the North Park, North Park, now he owns like 14, I believe 14, dealers dealerships in san antonio but but at that time when i was working with ford and lincoln clarence kalig was the largest his lincoln dealership was the largest dealership in san antonio north park lincoln mercury is the largest lincoln dealership well he's half latino his mother is latina and so when I said to Clar Clarence, was the one that was asking me, you know, Cynthia, what, what ideas do you have? I said, you know, let's bring in Mariachi Vargas and let's bring back this concept to San Antonio because it had been gone for, for many years. And he said, let's do it. Didn't even hesitate. Let's do it. Picked up the phone called Lincoln Division. They came in with the funding. And then the, the four dealers were like, well, we want to be part of it too. I'm like, great, let's, let's do it. So they came in with, with some additional funding and uh, together Ford and Lincoln Mercury, it's, it was Lincoln Mercury at the time, of course now it's only Lincoln, but they were the ones that, that you know, provided the seeds to bring back that concept. And that was back in 1995, we had two concerts at the Majestic Theater with members of the San Antonio Symphony and the, they were both um, incredibly well attended and very successful and so Ford continued to fund those for 13 consecutive years up until the downturn of the automotive industry which occurred in 2008-2009 and so whenever I bump into one of the Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealers, I, I always like say, I don't think Ford corporate ever will ever, ever realize the impact they had in funding this because it was a whole new era for mariachi music. Um, those, you know, there were, there were, there were, there were mariachi music programs in San Antonio and and they participated that first year. And I remember the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley had a mariachi music program at the time and they participated. But that was kind of the start of the next era of mariachi. The, the 1979 was definitely the first era. 1995 was the, well, no. 1979 was the first era. Linda Ronstadt, Constantin is a Mi Padre tour in 1987 was the next push in mariachi music. Then 1995, when I brought back the mariachi music festival, was that next era. And then what came after that? Sebastian de la Cruz. So what was happening? When I brought back the Mariachi Music Festival in 1995, we saw slowly the growth of more Mariachi Music programs, more cities coming in with schools throughout those first 10 years. It was, um, it was a, 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 slow, a slow but progressive growth among Mariachi Music programs and schools. Now Sebastian 
was one of the participants in the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza vocal competition. We, we established three competitions as part of the extravaganza. as a national mariachi group competition, a national mariachi vocal competition, and then the original songwriting competition. So back in, let's see, 20, when was Sebastian on America's Got Talent? I believe in 2012, was it? Or he was in the 12th season. I can't remember exactly what year that was. It was already about 10 years ago, I think. But Sebastian, I kind of like give him his own error because uh, he was competing in the vocal competitions. We were videotaping the vocal competitions at that time. We were videotaping all of the finalists who competed in front of members of Mariachi Vargas in that vocal competition. We, we posted these videos on YouTube and then we started seeing messages from America's Got Talent. They were posting these little messages on Sebastian's videos. And it said, we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to, to get in contact with this kid. You know, we'd like to, you know, reach his parents. And, and so we were calling Juan and said, hey, Juan, did you see that message? You need to get in contact with these people. And so uh, Sebastian was invited to uh, audition for America's Got Talent. And this was a real, real change for the genre, for Latinos in general, for Latino music in general, because I really do believe that it was the first time that we had seen mariachi music on mainstream American television. Okay, we had seen Linda Ronstadt but once Linda Ronstadt did her thing, that was it. We hadn't, we hadn't seen anything for years, for two decades, three decades, I believe. It was, it was years. But then when Sebastian De La Cruz appeared on America's Got Talent, this not only put San Antonio on the map, it not only put mariachi music on the map, it was so much bigger than that, it put Latinos on the map. And that was huge. It was, in, and after that, we were getting phone calls from parents saying, oh, we saw that kid on television and now my little boy wants to be part of a mariachi group. After that, we really saw the growth of mariachi music programs at, in schools and, um, and at the college university level as well. And it was just so powerful because mariachi music was not portrayed very well on Spanish language television. It was hardly portrayed. And then when it was portrayed, it was the worst portrayal, okay? What were we seeing? Don Francisco. And it was always portraying mariachi music like clowns clowns it was like hey it was just clowns it was never a full mariachi group to begin with with a good 12 or 14 musicians it was always just a little trio remember they were producing these out of i think mostly miami so they were grabbing whatever they could get it was all the stereotypical images of mariachi music the the men with the big bigotes the the big bansoncitos, the older, the older men. It was, it was just such a stereotypical negative portrayal of mariachi music because the music wasn't good. It was not good at all. It was, not, it was not the way we knew mariachi music to be so beautiful and elegant and, and uh, folkloric, but with incredible, you know, orchestral and and operatic influences. It was it was just the worst portrayal of our culture and our music. So Spanish language television is not credited for doing anything for mariachi music. But then, after they saw what general market television was doing with little Sebastian de la Cruz, that changed things. That cha now Spanish language television was coming around to South Texas and knocking on the doors of these kids say, hey, you want to audition for La Voz Kids, for La Voz Mexico, 
for these programs that were coming up in Spanish language television, now they were coming around and wanting our Mexican American kids from South Texas. They learned from English language television. And so it was a whole new era. And that opened up, Sebastian opened up doors for a lot of our kids from South Texas. He, he did that by going on America's Got Talent. He opened it up. He opened up the doors. And we saw more opportunities that followed that, that mass publicity that was going on. Um, you know, also, you know, caught the attention of organizations like the Houston Grand Opera. The Houston Grand Opera. Actually, I'm trying to think of now which happened first, the Houston Grand Opera or Sebastian Dela Cruz. Because the Houston Grand Opera came to me and said, you know, Cynthia, we want to, we want to have a mariachi opera. Can you recommend a composer for the music? And, uh, and so I said, absolutely, come to San Antonio during the extravaganza. I'll introduce you to Jose Pepe Martinez, senior, the musical director of Mariachi Vargas. He'd be the perfect person to write the music for the opera. And so I paired them up together, and then he wrote the, the music for the very first Mariachi opera, Cruzar la Cara de la Luna, and then there's been two operas that have followed since then, actually three, three operas that have followed. And then, and then after the first opera, it was the second opera where the Houston Grand Opera invited little Sebastian Dela Cruz to be part of that opera. And since then, there's about five of our former winners from the Maria Vargas Extravaganza that have gone on to perform with the Houston Grand Opera, the Fort Worth Opera. And those opportunities have been amazing. I mean, Vanessa Sarda Alonso, she is one of our grand champion vocal winners uh, from the Maria Vargas Extravaganza. She won when she was only 18 years old. She's, I think, 35 now, and she's had a 10-year career working with the Houston Grand Opera. She's performed at the Theatre Châtelet in Paris, France, and Houston and Fort Worth and San Diego and Phoenix, I mean, all over the country, and she's uh, just been amazing. And so, um, so yeah, I consider that, that, that era, Sebastian de la Cruz. And then what, what has been the next era after that, after Sebastian, um, now it's been, you know, 25 years since I've been producing the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary last year. So this is our 26th year, and I feel like, like this is just the beginning. Like what we've done in the past 25 years, it's, um, I feel like right now, we're just seeing more television programs appeal to Mexican and Mexican-American audiences. And it's just at the very beginning stages. But as that continues to grow, I think more opportunities will open up for our kids in South Texas. And uh, which has just been very, very influential in, in, in portraying Latinos the way that we've wanted to be portrayed for decades. Mariachi music um, is so powerful, and I tell these kids, you know, all the time that when you combine education, youth, and talent, you can rule the world. You can rule the world. You're, it's so powerful when you combine those three things. And so that's what we're seeing here with now with thousands of kids involved in mariachi music programs in Texas and Las Vegas. And I just came back from Chicago and, uh, and even Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was just there. And they, you know, are starting mariachi music programs too. And so it's very exciting to see the growth and, and all of the young people involved. Yeah, so that brings an interesting question of, um, so as it gets more popular, we see more influence like with pop culture and with mariachi taking sort of a bigger stage and what 
came to mind, like as you were just talking, mm -hmm. like what is this next stage? Mm -hmm. um, like Coco came to mind, mm -hmm. and how there was a lot of musical influence in that movie, and there were a lot of little kids also dressing up with the guitaron and like going around and you know, imitating that and trying to be that. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that had an influence? And then mm -hmm. what do you think the future influence of um, like pop culture will be on mariachi? I, Coco definitely had a, a mass, mass, massive influence on, um, on mainstream America, uh, definitely. And it opened up the doors a little bit for mariachi. Uh, the, the music wasn't, the music wasn't the best, okay? The story was great, but the music wasn't the greatest. Um, it was good. Um, but, but Coco, Coco was good in, in bringing that story to the forefront of American culture. So that was an important, important era and significance that had a big significance. Um, now, some people, ca some, some groups have done this well, of like this fusion of mariachi, and we're seeing all kinds of different things going on right now. Some people, some do it well, and some do it, oh, you know, not so well. Um, I think one group that was just right here in San Antonio recently that I think does it very well is Flor de Toloachi. Saw their performance at Sam's Burger Joint. And these are four very talented women who I think have gotten it right. Their, their music is enjoyable. It's fun to listen to. It's a fusion of mariachi music um, and, and, and just general market, really, uh, all kinds of, of music. But they do it really nicely. They do it well. They, they have everything from salsa to um, cumbia to... Um, traditional, you know, boleros to, you know, something they can do in English. Uh, but they do it, they do it nicely. It works for them. I don't know if it works because it's all female, so that's already going out of the tradition of all male musicians. That's already breaking that tradition. You have these female voices that can sing very nicely you know, songs that, that probably don't really, would sound very well with all male voices. So um, this works, in, it works for whatever reason. Um, Metalachi, you know, is not probably, I don't know, I would never even really listen to their music, but it's, you know, it's mariachi music. There are two instruments that you have to have in a mariachi group to make it, really, to call it a mariachi, and that is the guitaron, the bass instrument, the big, round, big back, big instrument, and, and the vihuela. The vihuela is the, the five-string guitar-like instrument with the round back, and it has a very crispy sound, okay? So you got that bass, and you got that crispy sound. That is those are the two instruments essential to mariachi groove. So, so there's um, there's there's the the and there's so much history behind the songs. You know, so much of the music has been around for a hundred years, seventy five years, fifty years. So there is there is something to to that authenticity. The traditional sound is very beautiful, and when you try to break out of that traditional sound too much, it doesn't always work because um, there's just so much meaning behind the music to begin with and, and the language is so beautiful and if you try to interpret that in English, it just oftentimes it just doesn't work whether it's related to mariachi or not right? So I'm kind of one of the, the traditionalists. I like, I like the real, real solid traditional stuff. Okay. <laughs> Music. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back because um, I want you to talk specifically about your role in Mariachi Extravaganza. Okay, so my role as the, mari as the producer of the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza is, um, is, uh, is 
producing the whole event. It's funny because I started my company and I still run my company as Munoz Public Relations. So oftentimes, um, I think people in the community have said, oh, this is Cynthia, she does PR for Mariachi Vargas and the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza because they see that name, public relations. But we actually are a very untraditional public relations company because we, we are, we're the producers, we're the promoters, we are the marketing agent, we are the event coordinators of the entire Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza. So it's kind of pitting all of those. It's all public relations. <laughs> it's all event planning, media relations, community relations. You know, uh, you know, it's all of those el those elements that fall under the umbrella of, of public relations. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I'm I'm the producer of the event, and we've been doing that now for like I said, this is our 26th year, and. I used to produce shows with Maria Chivargas in Laredo and the Valley and Corpus Christi and Austin and Dallas and Houston and Atlanta, Georgia and many other places. Uh, but San Antonio was all, has always been just that one place that includes the entire Mariachi Music Festival and all of the uh, elements uh, that come along with that, which are the mariachi workshops, the mariachi group competitions, the mariachi vocal competitions, the, um, the master classes, the community presentations. There's about a dozen events that take place during the Mariachi Vargas extravaganza. And every year that I produce this show, I always feel the same as I did the very first time I produced it, or the very first time that I saw Mariachi Vargas in 1979. I still feel that way, like, oh my gosh, these musicians are amazing. These vocalists are incredible. They, they change lives. I always tell people when you come to the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza, you are never going to be the same. It's going to change your life. And um, when people see it, they experience it for the first time. I ask them after the concert is over, well, how do you feel? Like, I feel like it changed my life. And it changes people's lives because it is, it, is, um, it is the greatest representation of our culture. These artists are phenomenal, phenomenal musicians and vocalists, and it breaks all stereotypes of what people might have of the Latino culture or of the mariachi, of mariachi music. It is, it is a whole different portrayal. It's elegant, like I said, it's beautiful, it's elegant. It is, um, you know, folkloric, but with those operatic symphonic influences, it's just in a whole another level of performance. And so it changes people for the better. It brings people together. It, creates a better understanding of who we are. Um, so it's a very it's a very positive and I always tell people it's very clean. It's very clean, it's very positive, probably very conservative. You know, people are dressed in full, beautiful attire, very elegant trajes and dresses and you see families coming together and supporting their kids, um, all wearing the same shirts with the name of their student who's competing that day, or buses painted like you would see for football teams, but they're with a mariachi, you know. Um, it's, there's such a tremendous amount of cultural pride and appreciation and support for these youth and it's, um, it's just something that's so powerful in so many ways. I tell people, you know, my, it's, it's, it's political, it's social, it's cultural, it's, um, it's very powerful in so, different, in so many different levels. Okay. So um, do you have a non-traditional category or element to the extravaganza? Or would that cause a bit of an uproar if there was a non-traditional like competition or element um, to 
I guess, of the events that day. Or those three days, because it's three days, right? Mm, it's seven days. Oh, seven days. Okay. And we start the event with a mariachi mass at San Jose Mission, because that's where I started. That's very important to me, and we have traditionally awarded a scholarship in the name of Geraldine Boo Boo Orta Charles in her memory and the memory of the Orta family and their contributions. And we, we have done that pretty consistently for, for many years. And so that's how I always love to start the Mariachi Extravaganza off with the Mass at San Jose Mission. And we usually invite one of our vocalists to sing. And it's always a very, very beautiful and special moment. And then we have um, community presentations. Uh, you know, we have them in, at, at events for senior citizens. We have them at, um, at universities. Uh, we, we usually bring a member of Maria Chivargas in ahead of time, and the, they might give a master class for vocalists and mariachi musicians at UTSA or, or UT Austin or some of the other campuses. Um, so there's a lot of events gearing up. The, the first big, big event is usually uh, at, the, uh, at the Riverwalk. We have a Serenata en el Rio, uh, usually on that Thursday, the week of the extravaganza, and that's where all of the mariachis who come in from outside of San Antonio start to convene. And last year we had over a thousand mariachi musicians. A large number come from Las Vegas, but we also had students from Utah and all over, all over Texas. And we have a beautiful, beautiful showcase of just performances on the Riverwalk. It's usually there at the River Center Mall Lagoon area on the bridge. They set it up so beautifully for us, and the groups love it because it celebrates the holidays also because of all the beautiful Christmas lights on the Riverwalk. And, and then we have, you know, we get into the workshops and then the competitions for the next two days. So there are three really key, key days, but it, it does, it is actually a full week um, of events. And uh, are there any non-traditional events that go on during that week? Not really. Um, there's different presentations, you know, just at different levels as far as the number, but it's, you know, we're pretty hardcore traditional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we haven't, yeah. Okay. I think San Antonio's is pretty, you know, San Antonio's mariachi music um, community is pretty traditional. South Texas is pretty, pretty traditional in general. Yeah, so if we want to pull in something that is non-traditional, we'd have to pull that in from New York, where like the Luwachi is based, or, or California, I don't know, where the Metalachi is based, or yeah, we'd have to pull in, and for me, that's bringing, like trying to bring sand to the beach. We've got so much talent, so much phenomenal talent, right here in our very own backyard, that, that we are very conscious of utilizing that and celebrating it and incorporating that into the show, and I've always been extremely proud that we are one of the few organizations that make a conscious effort to present Mexican Amer the Mexican American experience and the Mexican from Mexico experience together on the same stage at the same time. I mean, who does that? Who does that in concerts? Does usually here you see one or the other? Very few times do you see both. And that's important to us. It's important to us to even build bridges of understanding between Mexican American and Mexican communities. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay. Um, what is the most difficult part of running the Mariachi Vargas Estravianza? <laughs> um, what is the most difficult part? Well, the most important part 
are the supporters, are the sponsors. That that's a driving force. I mean, without the sponsors, this event would not be able, would be not be taking place. Um, so, Gonzaga Medical Group is our presenting sponsor and has been for the past few years. Uh, once I mentioned, once the downturn of the automotive industry occurred, Ford no longer sponsored the event. They cut back on everything significantly. But other companies have supported it, and Gonzaga Medical Group is is um, one of the, the key supporter. And Dr. William Gonzaba is the owner of Gonzaba Medical Group. He founded this company 60 years ago, right here in San Antonio. He has seven medical clinics and 700 employees and is very passionate about the culture. He's, he's passionate about the culture. And we're very grateful that he uh, supports this event. So that's, that's I'm gonna say that's the most challenging uh, it's, it's the most important and the most challenging part of the extravaganza is finding those supporters because San Antonio is a city that supports the arts if you are a nonprofit organization. If you are a for-profit music festival producer, you get zero support, which I don't understand why because we're filling up over 600 hotel rooms. We're bringing in revenue to the city. I hope that one of these days we can change that mindset of the city so that our city becomes, you know, is willing to invest in music festivals that draw tourism regardless if they're for-profit or non-profit. Um, so, unless I, I, you know, decide to start a nonprofit, which that's not my, my model, it's not where I come from. I come from advertising, marketing, promotion, production. That's what I know. So, um, it's worked, and it, I'm grateful for companies like Gonzaga Medical Group, Valero, HEB. Those are the companies that have supported this event and we have to have to be grateful and, and express our gratitude for that to them every chance we get. So that's a, that's the most challenging part. Always is the most challenging is the sponsorships. The second most challenging is um, what it's 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 a it's a good problem to have is you know really thinking about the growth. How do we handle the growth? I mean we we can handle a thousand, maybe eleven, twelve hundred that we've had in in mariachi musicians at, at a given time. Um, but I th we're going to get more. We're going to get more every year, and and we have to start planning for that growth. More space at the convention center. I, you know, the venues. It's challenging because we've got. Here in San Antonio, venues that are that 2300, we've got the Majestic, we have the Lila, we have the Lori Auditorium, and then after that number, 2300 uh, capacity, then there's nothing else unless we go to the Alamo Dome where they can accommodate a, you know, more, but in the Illusions Theater, or we go into the AT&T Center, which is you know huge, but there's nothing that, that's in that 3,000, 4,000 seating capacity. So what do we do? We're, we're, we're at a great place. We're selling out. So what do we do? We have, maybe we have two shows. Uh, maybe we you know, need more space at the convention center. So those are things that we're thinking about now for the 26th anniversary of the extravaganza in December. We have to start planning for those. and and. Uh, uh, that's a challenge, and then, um, and then, uh, then the other challenge is is just physically. You know, m my body can't do <laughs> what it used to do. Uh, you know, at 30, 26 years ago, and so I work really hard all year long in um, in training. I like to do uh, I do a triathlon every year. 
I, uh, I, I'm an avid cyclist. I mean, I really work hard to uh, maintain my health because I love what I do and I love what we do as a community and I want to keep doing this for another another 20 years. Okay. Um, how would you best describe your role in mariachi music in San Antonio? I, I, I would say that I'm a leader, I'm a visionary uh, planner. I, I, you know, we all have a really important roles, whether we're a musician or an educator, um, or in the, um, in the planning stages, which is like how we, we, we play that role of, of, of putting that whole festival together, making it happen. Um, um, and so we all kind of work together. It is, this event though is really, I always tell people, it is an entire community that puts this event together. It's every single parent out there that is taking their kid to mariachi lessons or to class or to a tocada performance or that student that is working so hard to perfect their skill to strengthen their performance, um, their dedication and their commitment to the art form is to be recognized and applauded and supported in so many ways. And, and, then, and then what we're seeing, and, and the reason we're so successful, we're so successful here in South Texas is because those students have gradu are going to college, they're graduating they're getting their degrees and they're coming right back into the school system and becoming educators. And so they are teaching with all of the passion and commitment and dedication and, uh, and skill and know-how, you know, better than anybody, than any other part of the country because we're, we're recycling them now. And, and it's, that's why, that's why we, we see such strong mariachi music programs. I just came back from, from Chicago and they said, we've tried to recruit some of these mariachi educators from your neck of the woods, but they won't come. Nobody wants to come because it's, it's so cold up there and they're not set up to offer competitive salaries in a, um, in a market that is, that is definitely more expensive to live in. So they're not ready for us yet, but they want us and they recognize, you know, what we have here in South Texas. And then I always tell people San Antonio is so unique because we do have, could this extravaganza take place in any other market? This is, this is, this is the largest of its kind in the world. LA has a bigger audience for the Hollywood Bowl but they don't have all of the components of the competitions and the workshops and all of that. Um, Albuquerque has a beautiful event and a beautiful outdoor amphitheater and a casino uh, there, and, and they have a very nice event, but San Antonio's is still the largest uh, of its kind in the world. And it's really fun because every time when, when Mariachi Vargas or we, any of the artists that we bring in from Mexico come to San Antonio, we take them to the schools, they are just, um, they said, this doesn't exist in Mexico. We don't have this in Mexico. We don't have classes like this in schools in Mexico. And I was um, in an interview with the Maestro Ruben Fuentes, the owner of the Maria Chivargas, and a journalist from Houston. And the journalist asked the maestro, Ruben Fuentes, what do you see the future of mariachi music? Where is it going? He says, the future of mariachi music is dependent among the kids in the United States who are involved in mariachi music programs because the kids in Mexico are listening to junk. That's what he said. The future of mariachi music is dependent on the kids here in the United States. 
So San Antonio is, you know, itself is, is a leader, has been a leader in mariachi music um, programs because of the infrastructure of mariachi music programs at the school level. And, and, and now we're really trying to put a lot more attention at the collegiate level. Um, it's exciting to see where UTSA is at, UT Austin, these are schools with with new leadership in their mariachi music programs that are ready to take the programs to a whole new level. Now we're seeing SAC, you know, winning in the competitions, which we had never seen before. And so our programs at the collegiate level are, are moving up the ladder and becoming more competitive and are have, have new leadership and energy, and that's going to be a really, really important part. I've always said that that the future of mariachi music is very dependent on what happens at the collegiate level, because this is where where the leaders the leaders are. Okay, the leaders in community. Do I answer your question? Kind of, sort of. But we'll we'll go on to this next question, or maybe it'll. We'll, we'll get a, get right right down to it there. Okay. Um, so how do you can how do you see continuing this legacy of this event and what will happen after your leadership isn't there anymore? How do I see how do I see continuing this legacy? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, continuing to do what what we've been doing, um, but but in a bigger way in a bigger way. Um, John Quinones was our master of ceremonies at the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza last year. And he said, we need to produce a documentary. We need to produce something that's gonna get into film festivals or Netflix. Or We have to share our stories, just like what we're doing here today on a broader scale with all of America and so I think there's a, a lot of opportunities to go in that direction again mass media video production film movies and tell our stories the way we want them to be told and portray our Mexican American community the way we want it to be portrayed so I see that there's there's more video projects you know in the future and uh, and then who is going to carry on my legacy it's it's going to be this next generation of kids and I've got a couple of, of, of young people working for me uh, who are mariachi musicians and they are um, one is a UTSA student uh, taking the music marketing program at UTSA Leon Camacho I'm super excited that UTSA has this program of music marketing. That's probably what I would have studied had they had that program uh, back when I attended the university, but they didn't. So I studied American studies, we're the few and the proud. <laughs> um, but now they have music marketing, and so a lot of good talent is coming out of these programs. Uh, Deborah Torres is uh, she is the owner of of Mariachi Flor de Jalisco. She has an all-female mariachi group. Has worked with me for many years, and um, you know there's there's no shortage of incredible talent. If you if if you ask little Sebastian de la Cruz, what are you planning to study? You know what he says, marketing. <laughs> He's already planning on, on, um, on his future as well, and so I think there's, there's, a, there's no shortage of incredible talent and students that that have um, the vision that we all share to continue broadening opportunities for students and for artists and um, and for you know our culture in general and so yeah so we're it'll be it'll be one of these students I can guarantee you it'll be one of these students I'm not sure which one but one of them okay. how do you feel about being called as I saw it in a few articles the queen of mariachi Uh, 
Um, it's a fun term that people use. It's just kind of fun. I even, I even use it with all the, the kids out there who, who are such amazing singers, who are, you know, are award-winning uh, artists and vocalists. And I, I'll refer to the, the boys as my prince, or I'll refer to the girls as a mariachi princess. And we even got t-shirts made one time that said mariachi princess. And so it's, it's a term of endearment I, that's used most of the time for, for people in, in, our, um, in our genre. But I just, you know, I think it's cute. It's, it's cute. <laughs> Do you have a shirt that says Queen of Mariachi? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, absolutely not. <laughs> OK. Um, what city? would win the title Mariachi Capital? LA or San Antonio? San Antonio. San Antonio by far. Um, it's interesting that, you know, there, there's, there are these very large cities, Houston and Chicago and Los Angeles, that, that haven't quite figured out how to build up that mariachi music programs in the schools uh, and it's 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 there um, Las Vegas has done it very well Las Vegas actually has more students enrolled in school-based mariachi music programs today than San Antonio does so they set up their mariachi music programs as um, sort of like metal shop and woodwork where you know it's actually giving the students a skill and that's how they set up their mariachi music programs and they're very successful and they know how to work as a team and raise money and we get a lot of students from Las Vegas coming into the extravaganza every year but but they don't have the money to go extravaganza. They and it's they don't they don't have that that annual music festival. So that again is something unique to San Antonio. But there's no doubt that San Antonio, San Antonio is the capital of mariachi music. Now the Rio Grande Valley would would argue probably against that because so many of the strong programs uh, originate from the Rio Grande Valley. All of the cities, uh, McAllen, Harlingen, well, not so much Harlingen, but McAllen, Edinburgh, Ed Couch, Elsa, Brownsville, Roma, Rio have incredible, incredible programs um, back in February. And so we took 16 students and three directors to spend an entire week in a residency program performing throughout the community and then performing two shows at the Hill Auditorium. And, um, and we see how they operate. They, uh, they run their mariachi music program like the military. And from, from the moment school starts, um, students are asked to formulate a line uh, outside the door. And then they are taught how to walk into the classroom and where to place their instruments and how to walk in quietly and how to be patient and um, everything is very, very strategic from the moment they walk into the classroom and their actions and their discipline throughout the entire year. There's no secret. There's no secret other than, um, than hard work and practice and discipline and commitment that those kids have to be the very best. So they were, they were, we took them because they won first place in the Maria Tevargos Extravaganza High School competition last year in December, and so that's why they were selected to to go and they represented all of us beautifully. They got a standing ovation at the Hill Auditorium. But these are all just high school kids, just like everyone else. But their their commitment is amazing. And they are when they commit to the mariachi music program, I, I think a lot of them are like 
mariachi music. Some of these schools don't even have orchestra, so it's like just mariachi music, and they give it 100%, and they tell us these kids are practicing every day in the mariachi class, sometimes before school, sometimes after school, sometimes on the weekend, sometimes in holidays. Um, and they're also really good if the, the, they, they prepare them in middle school and the middle school directors come help the high school directors when they need help. And the high school directors go help the middle school directors when they need help. And they are working as a team like that. So they're not teaching these kids how to discipline at high school. They're teaching them that at the middle school level. They start early, they start young. Okay. Um, I get off see. subject here. No, Did I it's ask perfect. You a question? You, no, we're, <laughs> it's all good. It's perfect. Um, I wanted to go back, and you kind of touched a little bit on um, the most enriching part of the mariachi. Um, Vargas is extravagant. So you kind of talked a little bit about the impact it had on people. And, um, but if you could go into a little bit, like what you see and the what you experience actually being there and seeing the students, like listening to them practice and working, to, working together. I know it's a very moving mm -hmm. experience. And I've seen, um, I saw one video of several groups of mariachis backstage and they all started to play the same song like as they were practicing and there was something really just amazing the person who posted said like this was <laughs> like an otherworldly kind of experience <laughs> yes, yes. i love that i love that that the comment it was from a, a videographer and he said it was like um it was like an alternate universe he said Experiencing the Mariachi Vargas extravaganza is like walking into an alternate universe. It's like it was it was so different for him, and um, it's it's people often say it's so hard to describe what's going on, but it's just it's just the energy that everyone's feeding off of one another and the cultural pride and the appreciation and the pride that the parents have for the kids that we all have for the kids. It's just this tremendous amount of pride and appreciation and positive energy and emotion. So there's kind of like three audiences that I kind of look at when you're asking that question. One of the audience is the kids and the families during the competitions. And, um, and so it is, um, it is, it is, it's just like any other competition, whether it be a soccer competition or a Miss America pageant or a cheerleading competition. It is, it is competitive. It is exciting. So everybody wants to be the winner. It is, um, it is, it's just thrilling. It's thrilling to see, to watch. It's fun, and it's fun. So there's that kind of energy coming from the competitions. And then, but then when I'm looking at the audiences that actually you know, go to the, the concert, the grand finale event that features these competition winners and, and Mariachi Vargas, I love sitting back in, in the back and just kind of watching the whole audience and people are very emotional. They're very emotional when they see the winners. They're just so proud of them. And there are people that are sitting in the audience just, you know, wiping their, their eyes. They're just so proud of these young artists. They move people with their talents. And and then during Vargas has set, that people are very emotional because of what these songs are about. The songs are about love, the yearning for love, the loss of love, um, the love for the country, the love for the culture, the love, the stories about animals, the stories about about the cities in Mexico and how beautiful they are, right? Atalpanico, Guadalajara. 
stories of there's songs about Monterrey, Mexico City. So, so I watch the audience, and there it's, there's a lot of joy, and and then there's a lot of heart wrenching memories that are resurrected because of what the songs are singing about. And so there's a lot of emotion, you know, throughout the whole concert. And, and people are very moved by the experience. So we have, we have that emotion. We have this, the emotion from the students and the parents. And then we have, Vargas is very emotional too. We have them in a whole different experience. They come and they, this is, this is their, this is the event they look forward to attending because they see the students are mirroring their performances and they are energized by the incredible talent that they see from these kids. They get energized from this whole experience from San Antonio. They come to San Antonio, they're bringing their wives, they're bringing their parents, sometimes they bring their children they don't do that in all of the other concerts they attend throughout the country. They only do that here in San Antonio. They San Antonio is, is like their second home. We oftentimes hear, well, we want to live in San Antonio. Some of them live in LA, only because I think, you know, the airport is more convenient for them to fly, you know, internationally in different parts of the, of the world. But, but um, there's, a, there's a few that live in LA, there's a few that live in Guadalajara, there's a few that live in Mexico City, that oftentimes are like, we want to move to San Antonio. <laughs> we want you to be in San Antonio. Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite mariachi song? Mocedades. It's a popurri. And um, it's, uh, it's actually a, a Spanish, a Spanish songs that were for, originate from Spain. And one is, is Eres Tu, one of the very first songs I heard from this rondalla from Monterrey scene. And, um, and I always, I love that song because it just like takes me back to my childhood, the, the very first songs I heard. And it's a, just a beautiful, it's about five different songs that are in that popuri. And, and it was really fun because when I was in Chicago just recently, actually in Ann Arbor, uh, Maria Chivargas played that song. And I hadn't heard them play it in a long time. And I said, oh, thank you so much for playing my favorite song. And um, it features like so many of them in, in that particular popuri, like I think like, like I don't know, at least half of them are singing some part of the Bobori. So kind of keeps me on the uh, level with all of them because I don't show favoritism. <laughs> all of them get to sing. But no, I seriously like that because it takes me back to my childhood. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit. And I wanted to ask you to tell me a little bit more about your experience with Up With People. Oh. Um, you kind of briefly talked about it yes, a yes, little bit. Yes, um, but if you could explain just a little bit about, I know there's still an organization that's still around. Mm -hmm. um, if you mm -hmm. could tell a little bit about, just a little bit about the organization itself and then how you got involved mm -hmm. with Up With People. So Up With People is, uh, is an organization that promotes uh, cultural awareness and understanding and building bridges of understanding among different cultures and countries, which is like the exact same philosophy that I've carried on to the Mariachi Vargas extravaganza. Uh, I see that our role is to build bridges of understanding among different cultures and countries and what we do. And so I've continued that philosophy of what I learned here in Up With People. I learned about Up With People when I was a student at Highlands High School. They came to my high school. They performed at the time. Dr. Lucille Santos, who was an associate superintendent for SAISD, her son Charles Santos was in the group, and uh, I saw him perform not at Highlands, but the next year when I was attending, when I was going to SAC, I saw him perform, and I thought, wow, what a great experience! You know, I, I, 
I went into audition, I wanted to interview, I wanted to uh, apply to travel with Up With People. So I applied that year, uh, my freshman year in, at San Antonio College. And I thought it'd be a great experience to, you know, to travel around the world, especially with the performing group that was about song and dance. And, and of course, because of the, the meaning behind Up With People, which was to learn about different cultures and countries and strive for peace around the world. And so I, um, I, I auditioned, I applied, I was accepted. And after my sophomore year at San Antonio College, I toured for a year with the group. And I, I was able to stay with the president of, of Up With People in Tucson, Arizona, which was the headquarters. He was my first host dad in the group because his daughter was traveling that year, Jenny Belk. And Mr. Blanton Belk, he was the founder of Up With People. I got to know him and his wife, Betty. And they are wonderful people. And um, they, it's an incredible organization that, that they started. Um, so I spent a year traveling and performing with this group. We had a two hour show. With, that we took to 80 different cities that year. We traveled throughout the southwestern part of the U.S. Um, we traveled on four different islands in Hawaii. We, we were in the People's Republic of China in December of 1985. We visited five cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, Xi'an, and Wuxi. We performed shows, we interacted with students, we were on college campuses at the time. This is like before they had Starbucks at Tiananmen Square. It was way back um, before it was developed as it is now. Uh, and it was an incredible experience for me. It, it really broadened my horizons um, tremendously. I mean, I was really young. I was 20, 21 years old at the time that I traveled. It was, it was, it was an incredible experience. Um, we lived and stayed with host families wherever we go, and so that's kind of something else I carry, I've carried along with me. Uh, we produce a beautiful summer camp here in San Antonio every year. It's called the Mariachi, Mariachi Extravaganza Summer Camp. It's at the Tobin Center uh, for the Performing Arts in the Carlos Alvarez Theater. And we get about 60 kids from all over the country that come in to learn from master vocalists. And we host them. We host a lot of these kids in our homes. We open up our doors and I personally host, you know, a half a dozen kids that will come in in my home. And, um, and I've, you know, just carried on like that tradition that I learned from Up With People. And that's the way we're, we've been able to make it happen because not everybody can afford to come in and spend a whole week in a hotel and, you know, we make it work. We, we help as many kids as we possibly can. And so uh, Up With People was, was, a, was um, a beautiful experience for me and uh, I not only learned about show production, but I learned about every aspect of it, merchant, from merchandise sales to marketing. Um, uh, we were in the halftime of the Super Bowl XX in New Orleans, Louisiana, so we, we got to participate in that. I was, I was actually not in that show because I was doing PR for my, my cast in Orlando, Florida. So I was in Orlando, Florida, in January of 1986, that's when the Challenger exploded. I was there driving down the street when the Challenger exploded, looked up, saw pieces falling from the sky. It was a very, very um, uh, sad, eerie experience for me. But, um, but there were just so many things that happened that year, and just having the opportunity to travel with a cast of 130 people who were from all over the country was an amazing experience. There were five of us from San Antonio traveling that year, so I wasn't the only one. But I'm, I'm grateful that I had my mom, I'm really grateful for my mom because, you know, I, I, I kind of auditioned just to kind of prove to myself that I could be accepted into a cast like that. I wasn't really intending on going. I, I'm, a, I'm a homebody <laughs> in San Antonio. But my mom was the one that said, you know, uh, 
what happened was I'd, I'd gotten my acceptance letter to go to Texas A&M College Station. The same week I had gotten my acceptance letter to go to uh, up with people. And my mom says, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go to A&M, of course. And she said, well, you know, maybe you should really think about going to up with people. This, you know, you'll, this is like the maybe the only experience that you'll have in your lifetime to travel to, to, to China. Um, you know, A&M will always be there if you want to come back, go, go to A&M, but this might be like the only chance, you know, you're young, travel all over the world, get to know different people. And I said, mm, okay, okay. <laughs> with my mom's encouragement, I ended up choosing up with people and I'm glad I did it was you know it was a very positive experience it was it's hard to be away from San Antonio from my family you know for the very first time especially during holidays you know spending Easter with you know strange family in Florida and but but it was um, it was an experience that I wouldn't change for anything in the world and I'm grateful that I, not only I had the opportunity to travel but uh, you know, later my nephew uh, ended up traveling as the drummer in, in the group. Um, and he traveled for six months. And so that was a beautiful experience. And it was, it was something that, that, you know, the whole community came together to support me because there's a tuition involved in going to Up With People. At the time, it was like $5,300. And, um, and there was a woman by the name of, uh, well, there was a couple, Bob and Vesta Brew Marbutt. They were, they were married at the time, but Bob Marbutt owned Hart Hanks Communications at the time, and, and Vesta Brew was his wife, and she was an amazing woman. They were amazing people. He was on the board of directors for Up With People, and so they helped us raise money and host fu they hosted a couple of fundraisers for us and so it uh, made it possible for for me and the other four people from San Antonio to travel with the group so um, I'd highly recommend it for anybody who wants that that experience to get to know the world and in a one-year period <laughs> yes okay so I think I'm come to the last question. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about or that you would like to add? Well, I want to say thank you to Dr. Maggie Rodriguez uh, for all of the energy and time and effort that she puts into um, the stories. Uh, she's been doing this for, for several years now and I'm so grateful that she selected mariachi music uh, as, as the focus of, of the story here today. And um, I'm just, I'm grateful for everybody that she's pulled in together to make this happen. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, involved in putting these stories together and capturing these stories. Um, We're, we all get to choose how we want to spend our time here on Earth. It's a very short time, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to work with so many incredible artists, and I feel like that every year that the extravaganza comes around, I feel so lucky to be surrounded by more than a thousand incredible artists. And um, um, we have we have uh, look forward to continue continuing that tradition and and also expanding. I'm always looking for more ways to help these young artists and and also expanding that um, whole effort into just Latino arts programming in general. And so we produce not only the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza and the Mariachi Extravaganza Summer Camp that I mentioned, but other shows too. Um, one of them is the Serenata para las Madres. And again, going back to my days with the Orta family and using what they taught me and the beautiful traditions of the Mother's Day serenades and 
you know, me spending my childhood going to different houses and serenading moms at one o'clock in the morning, and I've used used what I would learned as a kid and have now brought this to stage in a show that we've titled Serenata para las Madres. So this is a show that will be coming up May 9th at the Charlene McCombs Empire Theater. And it's to celebrate Mother's Day and honor our mothers and recognize them with all the beautiful music and songs. And we bring in Stephen Sandoval. He's the former Primera Voz de Maria Che Vargas de De Cariclan. And uh, he's been uh, a solo artist now for four years. And he is the uh, presenting artist, the main artist that we present here as part of this beautiful, beautiful show. Um, and then also, we, we just had a show um, just last weekend. It was with a group called Balena Bantla, another excellent representation of the whole Mexican-American experience. And this is a company that was founded by a girl in, from South Texas, uh, from Edinburgh. Her name is Andrea Guajardo. She resides in New York. Uh, and she founded this dance company that is of the same caliber of talent as Maria Che Vargas and Steven Sandoval and so many of the our award-winning artists and vocalists, but she's done a phenomenal job in, in this dance company, and she had a, we had a, two beautiful shows here in San Antonio last weekend, and she put to go, together a show called Valentina, which captures the experience of women who fought in the Mexican Revolution through dance and uh, stunning, stunning shows. So we're, you know, we're, we're grateful to have the opportunity to, to, uh, to put together all of these shows and, and um, we just, you know, want to do them on a, on a much broader level because even when my associates, they see these and people, they're like, this is how I got a phone call from a woman in Virginia who came to our extravaganza and she says, Cynthia, I want the whole world to know about the Latino culture through, through what you're doing here in San Antonio, through the extravaganza. This is, this is the greatest portrayal of the, of the whole Mexican-American experience. So we just want to keep on doing it and finding ways to broaden it and share it with everybody across the globe. Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> You're done with the Arctic freeze in here. Yes. <laughs> Are you, is everyone okay? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cold. I'm so sorry. That was amazing. Yes. That was really awesome. I mean, yes. And I was trying, I mean, I really, you talking about my family? Thank you. Yeah. That was hard for me to keep it together <laughs> a little bit, but thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. For that. You're welcome. Yeah, and I, I know that you may not want to say it about yourself, but you are a cultural bearer. And it, it's, it's something I can't really describe, knowing that my family helped you. And now what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They are my greatest mentors. They were my greatest mentors. Yeah, but you, I mean, what you have done is she was a, brought a, it to a, so many more people. She was a selfless, selfless, is that the word? She was a selfless woman who, it was never about her, Josephine Orta. It was, it was about the community. She, she gave so much. She gave so much to the community. That's, that's how I want to be, a giver. She gave her life. It was always about the community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was awesome.